Want to keep your dollars and cents? Then download the Sense app from the Office of Financial Readiness. That's Sense, S-E-N, money sign, E, to save for retirement, build credit, create a spending plan, or buying a home. You can't do any of those things without money. So if you have Sense, you'll download the Sense app. That's S-E-N, money sign, E, today. And be sure to follow at DOD FinRed on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And welcome to Military Matters. This is another Fast Take. Uh, I'm Rod Rodriguez. I've got Jack Murphy here. Uh, Jack is the architect of the last episode, last week's episode, uh, Future Wars, uh, the Rise of China, and the Implications on U.S. National Security. Jack, uh, first of all, thanks for doing the episode, man. That was a that was a very interesting topic. What what compelled you to talk about China and do this three part series? Oh well, I mean, this is a subject I've been interested in going back um, maybe eight years or so. Um, when I was having conversations with people in the intelligence community, and they started talking to me about. China. And they would talk about China as if it was this very serious threat. And I'd kind of look at him be like, hey, so so what? I mean, the, we, we had a, um, a Cold War with the Soviet Union, and they, that just kind of petered out like they, they weren't able to compete with us at the end of the day. Um, the Chinese military, it's like, ah, do they even have a Navy? How the hell would they even get across the Pacific? Well, well now fast forward to 2021, they do have a Navy. Um, but I mean, that was the point. It was that they were up and coming. They they were building their capabilities and their capacities. And the uh, intelligence game, which we're going to get into in the next episode of Military Matters with Matthew Brazil, the Chinese approach to espionage is very interesting. There's a lot of um, misconceptions and mythologies about it, but also there is internal debate amongst our experts um there's there's debates about exactly how chinese intelligence functions and um that that's a conversation and a, a a fissure within our own government um and, and a battle that gets fought back back and forth so anyway as i investigated and i i researched and i read books about chinese espionage and chinese military and, and i read a lot of white papers and range corporation studies and everything else myself I became increasingly interested in this subject and just uh, I don't want to call it a rabbit hole. So it's such an overused term, but it's a huge, huge subject that is often overlooked and not enough people diligently study it. Let's say the way we studied counterinsurgency or counterterrorism for the last 20 years. Um, and in, on that note, China poses an existential threat to the United States, something that terrorism never has and probably never will. Tell me about the existential threat. Uh, I, I, I'm I kind of with you on the subject of China. My initial reactions years ago were, uh, you know, that's where stuff is made. Uh, that's about as much as I right, cared right. about. The war on terror kind of took that limelight of like force on force threats. And for the last 20 years, we've lived in this weird bubble of like the only thing that can threaten democracy is terrorism. We forgot almost about the Cold War. We forgot right. about the threats of other force uh, of other countries, uniformed armies uh, structured, you know, in battalions and brigades and whatnot. Uh, talk to me a little about that, about that existential threat. And why aren't we are, are we just now waking up to it or are there folks that have been kind of sounding the alarm for a while? Yeah, so I, I might hurt some people's feelings here, but terrorism is not, was not, and most likely never will be an existential threat to the United States. Um, we constantly, we being the United States government, the media as well, um, and, and everyone else has talked about it in these terms for the longest time, especially after 9-11. And I'm not trying to minimize terrorism or, or say that it isn't a threat, but 9-11 did not come close to toppling the American government or destroying the American way of life. Terrorism continues, has continued. 
um, even a very serious terrorist incident, let's let's just say the sum of all fears, like something really bad, like catastrophic, like a, a nuclear weapon, like the, the like something out of a spy novel. They do actually get, you know, a nuclear weapon and get it into Los Angeles or New York or something like that and, and detonate it. That would be catastrophic and it would be horrible, but it still would not be existentially threatening to the United States. Um, no matter how bad terrorism gets, we can absorb those attacks. Uh, we can adapt to them. We can kind of um, counter them with our, with our own counterterrorism, military and law enforcement capabilities. It, it, terrorism is an issue that as bad as it is, we have been able to sort of handle and sort of figure it out. China represents a different type of threat because they are a nation. They R- are really rising. quick, Jack, really quick, Jack. I want to I want to just kind of recap that because uh, I, I think that's really important before you go into the, the discussion of China to really establish that n- we, we we were afraid of terrorist attacks, uh, you know, destruction uh, on, you know, huge scales and a, a large amount of loss of life. Yes, those are terrible. Those are awful. And that's what we've been preventing for the last 20 years. But I don't really think there was ever. And I think what you're saying is that there was never really the threat that ISIS, uh, black clad ISIS troops would be marching down uh, Pennsylvania Avenue. They would not be putting up the black flag over the, the Capitol building. Uh, the you know, there was never there has never really been a threat that ISIS would or any terrorist organization would fundamentally take over the government right. of the United States and topple our government. They they could do a lot of damage and achieve their terrorist goals. And by terrorism, that is the, you know, uh, uh, changing political or taking political action through the use of violence. Uh, there was never really that threat to the existence, to the identity of the United States. Go ahead, Jack. Well, yes, that's absolutely true. Um, Although we do have to acknowledge that this is how the threat was sold to us in many regards. And during the, you know, 2015 or so, there were people in America, you know, little old ladies in nursing homes who seriously believed that Sharia law was coming to the streets of their little town in Oklahoma. I mean, there were people who literally had this fear that Sharia law was going to take over the United States, which is silly. I mean, it, it, it's just objectively, empirically silly. That was never going to happen. Um, it, so that's what I mean when I say that, yes, terrorism is a threat, but it's not an existential threat. It's not something that is going to um, consume the United States. And e- even when we talk about China, we have to have a somewhat more nuanced uh, argument or conversation about that because China is most likely never going to invade the mainland United States. They're not going to come over here and take over the United States government. Like that's very unlikely. Um, What is much more likely is that China poses an existential threat to America in the sense that they knock us down a couple pegs in the pecking order of, of global order of international world order. um, So that America becomes a second rate state that we are no longer the predominant superpower in the world, that our vision of what human freedom and, and, uh, and values looks like is subverted and replaced with the Chinese view of what they think world order should look like, what they think, quote unquote, freedom should look like. That, that's really the existential threat. I mean, I, so, I mean, y- they're, they're fundamentally reshaping the future of humanity if they're successful in this sort of political project. But it's not as if there's going to be Chinese stormtroopers marching down the streets of Washington, D.C. Uh, that, that's fairly unlikely. Well, if they're, to, if to they're stormtroopers, if they're stormtroopers, they're not going to hit anything anyway. But I, <laughs> a little Star Wars reference there for the nerds in the audience. Um, but I, I, you know, absolutely. ISIS Probably most there, there's no way ISIS was going to topple the government and institute Sharia law and do all that stuff. Could China topple the U.S. government, put Chinese troops on the streets of Pennsylvania Avenue? Sure, but very, very, very unlikely to your point. They're trying to reshape the world. They're trying to become the superpower. They want to be uh, what the U.S. was, uh, you know, during the. The, you know, arguably the 50s, you know, that post-World War II era, the golden age of American history. We were everywhere. People looked up to us. We were 
Uh, we continue to be. I keep saying that we were as if the country has been toppled already or some some nonsense like that. We are still uh, the country people look to for guidance and leadership. People kind of fall in line with whatever we're doing. But uh, China is definitely their agenda is to become what we are right. and kind of usher in their their century. They want to be in charge. They want to be the global leader. Exactly. The Chinese century. They see that as their destiny, um, that they want to lead. They want to be in charge. What's fascinating to me about that last uh, episode was uh, there was a couple of things that as I was listening to, I'm trying to, you know, edit the show and piece it together. But I kept getting lost in the conversation because your uh, your guest, former CIA analyst. Uh, what's her first name? I forgot. I'm Gail. sorry. I know it's Helt. Gail, Gail, Gail Helt. Helt. Uh you know, her, her, some of the stuff that she brought up was things I didn't know about, like the, uh, the, the presence of Chinese troops in Serbia. I had yeah. no idea. And I was like, what? what? You know, I, I knew they had a presence in Africa. I knew they were making themselves known. I think they have their first external uh, naval base or some type of forward operating base in Africa. Uh, but I didn't know about the troops in Serbia. Uh we're, we're seeing them expand. We're seeing the Chinese military start to impose their presence on the world, different theaters, uh, theaters that we are currently working on in as well. Uh, when, when, you know, we talk about Chinese presence, military presence, uh, is there a fear that our two spheres might intersect? Well, they already are. And, and we see ourselves competing with them in Asia, Africa, I mean, really all over the world. Um, and there was a uh, there's a, a great article I want to mention on this subject. Um, it was published in the Wall Street Journal back in 2016. China discovers the price of global power, soldiers returning in caskets. And I'd just like people to consider this for a moment. Uh, because it's very interesting that the United States, we see ourselves and we are a global power. We just wrapped up a 20 year long war in Afghanistan. Um, we lost a lot of soldiers in the war on terror in Iraq and Afghanistan and even elsewhere. And the American public pretty much tolerated it. I mean, it's not that they were happy about it by any means, but they tolerated it like we accepted this is the price. We honored our soldiers when they came home. We, we saluted their service. We thanked the veterans when they came home. Uh, China lost a peacekeeper in South Sudan. Just one guy. Uh, it was Corporal Lee uh, was this soldier's name. Oh, and, and I'm sorry, there was a second soldier named Yang Shupeng uh, who died the next day. Uh, they were hit by an RPG in South Sudan where they were acting as peacekeepers. And the Chinese public flipped out about this. And part of it is because they don't have the sort of, uh, I hate, we don't have a national consensus in our country, but we have national conversations because we are a democracy. We have an, a, a fairly open society. Everyone knows we have soldiers in Afghanistan, but Chinese people were shocked that they had troops in Sudan. What? How, what's all this about? And, and they were outraged that one or two of their soldiers died there. Like, why are we in Sudan? What's this got to do? Uh, they're not understanding because of the Chinese censorship and the, how they've clamped down on the Internet. Like people are not even aware of this. So as China increasingly wants to become a global power, like, are they willing to or and more specifically, is the Chinese public willing to accept the military costs of trying to be that type of global power. And I think that's a very interesting question to examine and, and interrogate. And, you know, of course, the Chinese government is hoping that they will have control over um, the media and the minds of their public to the point that they won't really have to answer that type of question. But I, I think it's interesting to contemplate. That, that's a fascinating dichotomy. You have a country where the people know nothing about what's happening, and they are outraged at uh, the 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 smallest hint that the that their government is doing something uh, external to the the mainland country itself. And then well, we have like Gail United was saying, States, where people Gail was pointing out, you know, I was when, saying like when WeChat uh -huh. came around, and all of a sudden these Chinese people were getting on WeChat without censorship restrictions, and they were learning for the first time about the Uyghurs being oppressed, and they were freaking out about it. They couldn't believe it. Yeah, they're learning about it for the first I time. I don't even think. 
some of them didn't even know what what these people were. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, you, you know, you have a country where people are freaking out over these issues that are just becoming, you know, the slivers of, of truth that is coming out to them. But in our own country, we have people freaking out about shit that it didn't even happen. <laughs> we have people freaking there's so much information so much information we yeah. have people freaking out about mm -hmm. false things things that are not true um and i wonder to your point is china ready to deal with that uh we are in a world we i, I think that the difference is the that the u.s is learning how to deal with the amount of information available to its citizens we have free market on information you can get whatever you want you can you can get you can make up your own facts uh you can you can go out there and find the things that match your worldview pigeonhole you know force their their the shape into the you know square peg round hole in your mind and now you have your ideology and whatnot china does not have that um that available that 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 capability that their their people don't have that luxury to make up their own minds, it's, their it's minds are being made up them by the state. It's a difference in worldviews because in the, the United States, we have our constitution, we have our bill of rights. We believe people have freedom and they have freedom to make dumb decisions and make bad choices. You have, you have the right to this information, including all the bad and fake information. Uh, the Chinese look at our system of governance and our way of life, our, our, our society, and like, this is untenable. This is unrealistic because of what you're, what you're mentioning. You know, like the, and they look at their own society. They have a you know over a billion people in China. What does democracy look like in, in a country of a billion people? What does uh, freedom of speech and freedom of the press look like in a nation of over a billion people? And and for the Chinese government, they see that and they they say that would look like chaos. That would be absolute chaos and mayhem. If we had you know picture America with like four times more people. I, I was going to say, yeah, freak, freaking out about fake news all day, every day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. For perspective, folks, I just looked it up in 2019. Uh, U.S. population was 328 million. Uh, China, the current population of China. Let's check that out real time. Looking this up. One point three nine eight billion. It's a lot of people. Billion. We're talking about that's a lot of people. Jack's not off to say that there are four times as many people in China than there are in the United States. It's four times the amount of outrage, the four times the amount of of false information. Uh, you know, uh, what, what's the what's the alternative facts? Uh, that's a lot of people to potentially believe something that is not true or runs contrary to the state's uh, official stance, the state's opinion. And right now the state handles all of the, all of their media. And you can uh, see and if you, you say know, something that's out of line, getting arrested. You see our, our, you know, by comparison, chaotic freedom. I, uh, you know, the, the, now this explains why the Chinese government is so big. They use words like harmonious. We want to have a harmonious society. We want everyone kind of on the same sheet of music. Like how, how would in a free society, how would you even get a billion, 1.3 billion people on the same sheet of music to support any policy at all? How is that possible? And I'm not trying to make some sort of like vague, vaguely, you know, racist argument that like Chinese people don't deserve democracy. I don't believe that at all. I'm just saying that you take a billion human beings anywhere in the world and try mm -hmm. to get them to support one government, one nation that we're all moving in this in this sort of direction in, in a general sort of agreement. I, I mean, is it even possible to do that? Well, we live in a country where uh, every election for the president of the United States, arguably the most powerful position in the world has at least a couple of hundred thousand votes for Bigfoot. Um, that's the that's the world we live in. That's the country we live in. Uh, Jack, as we enter the next phase of this, uh, we enter your the next story, I believe, is going to be about uh, Chinese espionage. I want to take this back to Taiwan for a moment. Uh, espionage, future war, Taiwan. Uh, Gail's perspective on the importance of Taiwan uh, really hit home. She she was very adamant about the importance of 
the democracy and uh, preserving Taiwan's independence. But I did not detect too much of a fear of war, like all out full scale. Uh, China occupies Taiwan. We go to war with them over it. Uh, if China were to step into Taiwan tomorrow and said, you know what? Enough uh, of the uh, the the games. This is ours. We're holding it. Are do you, do you do you think that the U.S. would go to full scale war with China over the island of Taiwan? So there's a lot of ifs and maybes and buts uh, involved in answering that question. Nope, I want a solid answer. Just yes or no. Uh, Just yes or no, I, Jack. I, I, <laughs> I, I think I think the short answer is yes. We would go to war with with China, not not on mainland China, but we would go to war over Taiwan in the South China Sea. Yeah, I, I think so. And uh, we will we will talk more about Taiwan in this in part two, where we talk about Chinese espionage, and in part three, uh, I talked to Dr. Roger Cliff, who authored a major study for the Rand Corporation about this subject and armed confrontation with China in the South China Sea. Um, so we'll talk much, much more about how that could potentially happen and how it would unfold. Um, but a lot of it depends on how much forewarning we would have um, to a, a Chinese invasion. Right now, what we're seeing more of is China is trying to slowly alter norms in the region. It's sort of like that creeping, like you will be absorbed by the Borg cube kind of thing, uh, where they're just slowly trying to change international norms by pushing and prodding and bullying various entities and, and, and nations and players, including the United States, around in the South China Sea um, until one day they are right up on Taiwan's doorstep and they're able to come knocking so quickly that, you know, it, it happens. It, it could happen in the blink of an eye at that point. They're not there yet. Right now, the, the costs they would incur for invading Taiwan, both militarily, but also um, on the world stage would be so detrimental to their advancement that that seems to be deterring them from taking that course of action right now. Um, but there are a whole series of different ways. Um, and we'll talk about it more again in part two, part three, about how the Chinese, like for instance, if the Chinese domestic political situation begins to implode, the communist party in China may need to go do a war basically to legitimize themselves. And so there, there are other factors um, that have nothing to do with the United States that could eventually lead China to take that action at some point in the future. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the next episode, folks. If you've been listening to this, the, this episode of Woke, you've been exposed to two uh, wonderful nerd uh, references to Star Wars, <laughs> Star Trek. Uh, that's the beauty of having a fast take. Um, I'm really looking forward to it. Folks, service members, military families, veterans and retirees. Did you know that the Office of Financial Readiness has an app? I didn't. Now you do. Download Sense app. That's S-E-N money sign E. Sense app has the information you need for saving for retirement, building credit, creating a spending plan or buying a home. FinRed has the tools you need. Download Sense app for tips on the go and follow at DoD FinRed on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and follow us on Twitter at StripesMMPod. Go to Stripes.com and use promo code PODCAST to get 50% off your digital subscription. That's 50% off when you use promo code PODCAST. So not only are you getting smarter about the world, not only are you learning about potential threats, uh, existential threats against the way of life that is the United States government, we will save you 50% off your digital subscription to Stars and Stripes. Folks, some of the criticism I've heard about uh, what Jack and I do here at Military Matters is that for some, some, some of y'all think that, well, Stars and Stripes just follows the party line, man. They just, uh, they say whatever the DOD tells them to say. They've got a gun to our heads. Uh, or that we are shills, that, uh, you know, we're sitting in our multi-million dollar studios talking to each <laughs> other uh, while we count our millions of dollars because we got, you know, we're, we're being paid to say these things. Um, I can tell you right now, uh, I want to thank the wonderful people at Military Matter, uh, Stars and Stripes, really, because they don't tell us what we can and cannot say. Uh, they don't tell us what stories we can and cannot cover. We've talked about the deaths of special forces guys. We've talked about fraud, waste, and abuse. We've talked about the, sh the, the crap military housing. 
uh, there is, you know, nothing's off the table for us. And I will tell you that the journalism, the integrity at Stars and Stripes uh, is, is the same. So some of y'all are listening to uh, reading Wall Street Journal, reading, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that part. Yeah, some of y'all are listening to other publications. I'm telling you, Stars and Stripes, uh, it, 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 just give them a shot. Give them a shot. 50% off. Use promo code podcast. Uh, Jack, you got anything before we tail out of here? No, man. I think that's about it. Um, thanks for letting me do the show, everyone. I've, uh, I really enjoyed doing these episodes on China. So again, uh, next episode, Chinese Communist Party espionage. One after that is going to be part three, the final one in the series about what a, a war with China would look like. And then episode four, I already, or it would be episode five of this season, I should say. I've already done the interview with a special forces medic, and it's about the battle for Kunda's. Um, and this dude has an incredible story. He was on the ground, boots on the oh, ground, yeah. um, just a handful of green berets having to accomplish an impossible mission um, as the Taliban took over this entire city. Uh, so I think I think you guys are really going to enjoy that one. Folks, also make sure you follow Jack on Twitter. Uh, he is at Jack Murphy RGR. He also runs an awesome podcast called The Team House. Uh, what's new with The Team House, man? What can we expect? Well, cool? uh, hey, uh, the last couple episodes, I mean, I had Marty Peterson on, who was the first female CIA case officer in Moscow. Uh, that was a recent one. And then this last Friday, I had Paul Howe, who's a retired uh, JSOC operator who is at the battle in Mangadishu, the infamous Black Hawk Down incident, uh, interviewing him. And then this week is uh, Jade Parker, who is a counterterrorism analyst. Um, and she's one of the smartest people I probably know. So uh, looking forward to having that conversation. It's, the show is uh, done live 8 p.m. on Friday night. That's awesome. And uh, also check out a show that I've been working on uh, down at SOCOM. It's the official podcast of SOCOM. It's called Softcast. Uh, it is hosted by Sergeant Major uh, Matt Parrish. He is the uh, POTIF down at SOCOM and uh, Command Chief Master Sergeant Smith, who is the uh, senior enlisted guy down there at SOCOM. It's called Softcast. It's an awesome show. I have the privilege of having worked on it. Uh, we're doing a season two opener pretty soon with Tim Kennedy, uh, you know, I'll tell you what, that's another podcast that I was editing. Uh, I was absolutely thoroughly in Tim Kennedy is infectious with that motivation, man. He had me going. I was like, bro, I want to go throw a rucksack on and go get my CrossFit out. It was it was dope. Uh, <laughs> absolutely amazing. And here's the thing about podcast, guys. You don't just have to listen to Military Matters. You can subscribe to Military Matters. And we will sit right there in your podcast queue. You will listen to us. You get right over to the team house, knock out some soft cast and find some other podcasts that you're really interested in. Folks, if you have another show that you're interested, that you think we should be listening to, maybe there's something Jack and I are missing. Uh, hit us up, man. You can email us at military matters at stripes.com. Again, that's military matters at stripes.com. Send us an email. Tell us what you think. Uh, make your podcast suggestions we'll take a listen and we'll let you know what we think till then i'm rod rodriguez that was jack murphy we'll see you at the next episode